Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Ben Hobbs and I will be your host today. If you're joining us live, remember that you can ask questions at any point by clicking Q&A in the bottom center of your screen and typing those questions into the pop-up window. Uh, just a reminder, if you see a question that your classroom would also like the answer to, you can feel free to upvote by clicking the thumbs up icon located just below that classroom's question. And I'll make sure to prioritize these when we move into the Q&A session of our webinar. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's guest, Dr. Daniel Gillis. He is an associate professor and statistician in the School of Computer Science and the director of the Physical Science and Engineering Education Research Center at the University of Guelph. That's uh, certainly a mouthful. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Gillis. I will let you take it from here. Awesome. Uh, thank you for having me. And yes, I agree. It is quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, all right, let me get my screen shared here. I think it's happening. All right, does that look good on your end? Uh, if you just move into presenter view or in the slideshow view, we should be all good to go. Oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, is that good? That's perfect, thank you. Awesome, okay, so uh, once again, thank you for uh, inviting me to come into your classrooms and chat with you today. Um, I wanted to chat with you today about uh, basically sort of what I do as a faculty member in the School of Computer Science at the University of Guelph, and how uh, computer science, in my opinion, is much more than just uh, working with a computer and, and coding and such. So uh, the title of my talk is More Than a Code Monkey. And, and really it's all about uh, learning what you can possibly do as a computer scientist uh, if this is the job that you decide that you want to have uh, when you get older. Um, before I begin, um, I wanted to just uh, acknowledge the, the lands on which the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, occurs. Um, so the research that I do takes place on the ancestral and continued homelands of the Inuit of the Labrador, uh, of, uh, Inuit of Labrador in uh, Nunatsiavut, um, and that's the little red dot that you see there, that, that area of the country. Um, the work is also supported by uh, researchers from the University of Guelph, uh, where, I where I live, which is uh, located on the ancestral and treaty lands of the Atawandaran people and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And also uh, on the far west coast of the country, um, Wright Mesh in um, Maple Ridge, uh, British Columbia is located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Keitsi and Lumi people. And, and so we bring this up simply to recognize the territories and the lands on which we do this work, because the, the work that I'm gonna present, we do a lot of work with the communities um, in these regions and without their guidance, we wouldn't actually be able to complete the work that we're trying to do. Um, so it's really important to recognize their contributions to the, the, the research that I do. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of background on myself before I get into this stuff. Um, a lot of the work that I do, I, my background is actually in mathematics and statistics. And, and so the work that I do in that sort of domain is related to risk assessment, um, trying to figure out better ways of managing populations of animals or, uh, understanding uh, health impacts on humans. Um, I also, within the computer science domain, look at things like software design and uh, more recently looking at uh, bridging the digital divide, which I'll talk to you about in a, in a few minutes. Um, my work is also uh, community engaged, and this is both in the research and in teaching that I do, and, and I'll talk explicitly about that throughout this talk. Um, Community engagement, I think, is a very important component of a computer science, which most people may not realize is something that computer scientists can and probably should do. Um, and the last thing is related to pedagogy and andragogy, which is looking at um, better ways of teaching undergraduate and graduate students uh, so that the, the stuff that they're learning is easier for them to, to, to absorb and, and they can be the next, uh, basically the next change makers and innovators uh, that we need to develop solutions to big challenges that we have. Okay, so, but let's get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, so what does computer science look like? Um, now I imagine most of you, if you sit down and you think about this, maybe close your eyes and 
you think to yourself, what, what does a computer scientist look like? You probably might imagine something like this. Um, you probably imagine the, the loner sitting in their basement at their computer screen. Uh, this guy's got a cigarette, apparently. Um, or, or a group of guys sitting around a computer, pulling things apart, playing video games, that sort of thing. Um, but I, I want to challenge that image because, in my opinion, this is a very antiquated uh, image of what computer science should be and, and actually is. So if, if you look at these particular images here, um, I want you to ask yourself, is this what computer science looks like? Or is this what computer science could look like? Um, on the left, we've got uh, a group of people in Malawi uh, celebrating a local, um, a local event uh, and responding to um, basically uh, improvements in telecommunications that allow them to share information to help them farm better. On the right hand side, there's a picture of a student who is in the circumpolar north, um, up in, up in the, the Arctic essentially, doing research to help communities better manage climate change. So the question I have for you is, do you think this looks like computer science? Um, the reality is computer science is more than just computers. Um, Computer science is about people, and that's not a message I think that gets out there nearly enough. Um, yes, coding is important, and we want you to be great as coders, but there's so much more to computer science than that. Um, on the left-hand side here, we've got a group of individuals who are working on a community-based project to help uh, increase the amount of food that's being donated to the local food banks. Um, which is probably not something that you would necessarily associate with computer science. Most, most people probably think of computer science as algorithms and uh, lines of code and uh, maybe networking and that sort of stuff. Um, the, the group in the middle, or the image in the middle, is a, a group of students who are pulling together uh, bags of candy for Halloween that we're bringing around to a community uh, in order to give them in what we call reverse trick-or-treating. Um, but we're doing this because we want to work with the community and keep the community informed about the actual research and project that we're working on with them. Um, and so this is a sort of a social outreach event that we have, which again, most people probably don't associate with computer science. So we've got all of these like weird different things that we're doing um, at the University of Guelph when it comes to computer science. And my foray into this sort of stuff with um, community engagement uh, began a number of years ago in, in 2012. Um, ultimately, the work that we're doing, though, is related in some way or form to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of these. I, I, I assume you probably have at some point in time in your, your classrooms. Um, but again, most people don't necessarily look at these particular goals and think computer science. So when we look at things like no poverty or zero hunger or gender equality, we're not necessarily thinking that computer science has a role to play to solve these problems. Based on the work that I've done and the work that colleagues of mine have done, um, I would like to say that computer science is a, a tool that can be used to help develop or solve some of these uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so the very first foray, as I mentioned, was a number of years ago, and this was a project called Farm to Fork. And this particular project, uh, students in my third year computer science class were tasked with developing uh, a platform that would allow people in the community who could donate food to better understand what was actually needed right now at the food banks um, that were serving people who were hungry. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have with uh, food banks is that people assume that the, the donations that are needed are simply uh, things like craft dinner, uh, beans and, and other non-perishable items. But the reality is if everybody's only donating that, then we're not actually feeding people in a way that, that's going to help them. Uh, and, and in reality, a lot of food banks and food pantries can accept uh, perishable items like fruits, veggies, and uh, meat. So we wanted to connect people who could donate with the actual lists of groceries that were required at food banks and so the students worked to develop a website and, and a, a mobile app, uh, which we're hopefully going to be launching soon, um, 
to, to address this particular issue. Um, over the years, we've worked with many, many different community partners, and all of these are not-for-profit community partners. Um, they're not, the students aren't working to make money off of these things. We're just looking to use computer science to make the world a better place. So we've worked, uh, last year in particular, we worked with Community Living Cambridge to develop a tool that would allow students and young adults who are on the fetal alcohol spectrum of disorders better manage the medications and, and, um, and, and their healthcare uh, through the use of a, a, an app that was um, uh, slightly gamified. Um, we've also worked with Trickery Canada um, on uh, developing a, an app to help support the Trickery uh, event on Halloween. Um, all of these events or all of these projects are community-based and we've got students working directly with community partners who know things about, for example, fetal, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or uh, food security, hunger, that sort of thing. And it's not that I expect computer scientists to be experts in all of these domains, but what I want is for computer scientists to think about using their skills and working with the people who are experts in these areas to actually solve big problems, such as those that have been identified by in the list of United Nations Sustainable um, Development Goals. So the project I'm going to really focus in on, though, is a, a more recent project uh, over the last three or four years that I've been working on called Enoch. Now, this is a project that we've worked on with a community in uh, Nunatsiavut, Labrador, a small community of about 300 Inuit named, uh, the community is called Rigolette. And the community is uh, having challenges related to climate change. Uh, climate change is affecting the North much greater than it is affecting us. Um, for us, it's mostly an inconvenience uh, if we live in the South. But people who are living in the North, it's having a drastic effect on their ability to go out on the land, to go out on the ice, to do the things they, they traditionally would do to, to hunt and gather um, and to help feed themselves. And so the problem is uh, the ice that they normally travel on arrives much later in the year and melts much sooner. And so what happens there is that it becomes unsafe for the, the, the Inuit to go out and actually do the stuff they normally want to do. So they wanted to develop a tool that would help them collect information that would allow them to make decisions about when to go on the land and where to go when they actually go out. So as I said, climate change is having a huge impact and it's causing a lot of health risks associated with that. So they asked us to help develop this community-based monitoring program to help them track environment, condi environmental conditions and also, also health conditions. So the, the app looks something like this and we've been working with the community for a number of years to do this. And, and it's a relatively straightforward app, but we're developing it in such a way to make sure that the community sees themselves in this particular tool. So essentially what we were able to do here is develop a simple handheld app uh, for your mobile device or whatever that um, allows them to say where they are, what they see, um, collect environmental information, identify things like the tide level, the thickness of the ice, the type of snow that's happening. And then people back in the community, if they want to go out on the land, they can look at this information and make a better, uh, a more informed decision on whether or not it's safe to actually go out. Um, the, the, the tool is still being prototyped and such, but we are working with the community to get it released very quickly uh, across uh, all 300 uh, members of the community. Um, but the idea here is that computer science is being used to actually solve a real world problem. And it does involve the fact that we have to go to the community to work with the community members to better understand what they need um, so that we can build something that's going to be useful for them. The big problem, though, in the North is related to the digital divide. And, and this is a problem with connectivity, um, specifically in uh, the circumpolar North. There are many communities that don't have uh, cellular signal and a lot of them don't have very good internet. Um, Rigolette is one of those communities. Uh, some of the speeds that we've measured uploads per bit of about 0.5 megabits per second and download is often um, zero or slightly more than zero. So it's terrible internet. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a new computer science solution to actually bridge that digital divide. And so what we're working on as well is introducing something known as a wireless mobile mesh network. And in particular, what that's going to do is it's going to allow the community members to use the devices they have in the community already. There's 
um, because a lot of them do have cell phones um, or tablets or that sort of thing. So any device that has Bluetooth or Wi-Fi enabled on it, uh, these wireless mobile mesh networks will automatically allow the phones to connect to one another when they're in proximity. And any phone that might be connected to the internet through Wi-Fi will allow all the phones connected to actually be connected to the uh, internet as well. And the idea here is that this is hopefully going to allow us to better collect the information that's required for Enoch um, so that the community can bet, get information and share information in, in a much more real-time manner. The other thing it allows us to do, which is not something the community has been able to do before, is uh, introduce the idea of text messaging, something that most of us probably take for granted. But the community right now doesn't have that capability because they don't have a uh, cellular signal. So, so these are some of the things that we're trying to do uh, in the North and in most of the computer science projects that I have. They're all engaged with the community um, because I think, uh, as I said, computer science is much more than just sitting in front of a computer coding. It's about taking the skills that we have and trying to solve big challenges um, like the problems that we're facing in, in Rigolette um, so that we can, can do our best to improve the lives of people uh, who don't have the same sort of uh, you know, uh, things that we have here in the South. So that's uh, short and sweet, but everything that I wanted to say about the project. So I'll say thank you and open it up to any questions you might have. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gillis. It's, it's certainly interesting to see those aspects of computer science we might not even realize that are there that are already being used today to uh, increase the quality of life for people. Um, so I would just like to invite those classrooms to direct their questions to the Q&A. Um, you can do that by clicking Q&A in the bottom center of your screen and pipe, uh, typing your questions into the pop-up window. So our first question today um, comes from Emily at St. Mike's in Calgary. And she is wondering, at what age did you start coding and what program language were you using? Oh, that's a good question, Emily. Um, so I started poking away at coding probably when I was about uh, nine. Uh, but that was a very weird situation. My older brother uh, was just beginning to learn. Uh, it was called BASIC or QBASIC. Um, uh, he was beginning to learn it in high school. And I was a bit of a nerd. So I was watching him and started playing along and uh, learning how to code along with him. So. Uh, yeah, that was probably my first foray into it, probably around nine, nine years old or 10. Awesome. Um, so it got started young, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, and our next question here, um, they're wondering if you have ever used Scratch for coding, um, is the first part of their question. And have you ever used it to create 3D models? Oh, wow. Um, okay, so I have not personally used Scratch, although when we go up to Rigolette, we do um, head into the elementary and high school, Northern Lights Academy, and we do uh, teach the students with Scratch. So some of my uh, um, graduate students will teach the students how to use it. Um, so, so that's uh, for Scratch. Um, I have seen it being used for 3D models, but I think it was Scratch that I saw people using for 3D models, but I haven't personally done that. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, we, we actually did a webinar the other day, um, and we had students that have been using Scratch in their classroom. Uh, they started in grade four. Um, so they've now worked on that project for two years. So I'm wondering if that's from that same classroom. Um, awesome. So thank you for that. Um, our next question today is coming in from St. Joseph's High School in Ontario. And they are wondering what the hardest part of uh, being in computer science is. Oh, that's a really good question. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, the hardest part. Um, I, you've stumped me. Um, there, there, there's some, there's a lot of difficult things in, in all aspects of any sort of discipline you want to get into. Um, in computer science, for me personally, uh, I would say that the hardest part has been um, mostly getting, uh, initially getting connected with community and building relationships. Um, it's not something as a computer scientist you're typically taught. Uh, you're, not, you're, you're taught how to code and you know, how to build algorithms and that sort of thing. 
but learning how to actually sort of go beyond the discipline specific skills and, and work with community partners, uh, that, that can be challenging um, because you've got different, uh, different expertise sitting at the table that you're trying to work with, uh, different disciplines speak different languages, if you will. Um, so managing that and working in big teams, that, that can be a huge challenge. Um, and, and as a computer scientist, you probably will at some point work with a big team and work with uh, multiple different teams. And managing that is, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be fun. <laughs> well, that's certainly a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, our next question today, and they're, they're referencing something you mentioned earlier, that they say, um, you spoke of computer programming um, that is beneficial to communities. Um, and how do you encourage students to branch out beyond spending all their time behind a computer? And this is from Orchard Park uh, Public School in Burlington. That's a great question as well. Um, so the, the very uh, first time I, I see a lot of the students when it comes to community engagement, um, I actually bring it into the classroom. So our, one of our third year computer science courses, um, I always have the students partnered with a not-for-profit or charitable organization. And so the students are working to solve one of their problems. So for Community Living Cambridge, for example, it was developing the, the app to help support better health decisions for people with, for young adults with uh, on the fetal alcohol spectrum of disorders. Um, so it starts in that particular classroom, um, but often the, the students who have worked on, that pro on those projects, it, it's impossible to finish them in a 12 week period over the semester. So many of them continue working on the project in their independent study courses in their fourth year. Um, I also hire students um, to, to help out with these types of projects. And any of the students that work with me, I, I just present any type of opportunity possible um, to get them connected with community partners. Um, I kind of keep kicking them in the butt to get out there and, and work with the uh, community because it's a great learning experience. Um, it's great for your resume. Um, and, it, and it just, it feels good to know that you're doing something good for other people. Yeah, it's certainly, a, it's certainly a great thing. And obviously it has a lot of benefits um, for the community. Um, do you mind explaining where you came up with this idea to combine uh, the community engaged uh, learning and computer science? Sure. Um, I would like to pretend I'm super smart and that was how I came up with it, but I stumbled into it perfectly, honestly. Um, the uh, 12 or 12 years ago, in 2012, um, a buddy of mine, we were talking about uh, just doing something in the community to, uh, we, we figured if the two of us could do something in the community to make things better, uh, whatever that happened to be, uh, that would be sort of enough to demonstrate that if, if we could do it, anybody could do it. Um, and we, we searched around for a project and ultimately what happened was we were connected with some people on campus at the University of Guelph in the um, Community Engaged Scholarship Institute. And they told us about this issue of hunger in the community and people not getting enough to eat uh, at certain times of the year. And very quickly we saw this as a, a communication problem and it was just during this meeting with the, the folks at the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute where we just had this thought like, hey, can't our students work on this? Um, and I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I fully expected the students to revolt because they typically would learn how to build a video game, uh, but they embraced it. Um, they put in so much time and effort into the project and it, it was just, I, I stumbled into it and it worked. And it's been the way I teach the course ever since. Interesting. Um, so our next question uh, comes from Patricia and she's wondering what is the hardest part um, about convincing students that computer science is so much more than, as you described earlier, someone sitting behind a computer screen? Um, surprisingly, it, it, it's not as difficult as you might think. Initially, when, when I first present projects to students, they they, they get, uh, especially in this course um, where traditionally they were learning how to build a video game, uh, they get this sort of quizzical look uh, and, sort, and, and, and thinking like, what are we doing? Like, why are we doing this? Um, and then when they stop and think about it for a minute, they see that, oh, this is not really that much different than building a video game. We have to understand what we're trying to build, why we're trying to build it, who our users are. Uh, it's just a different application. So once the students see that and once they, they, they get connected and invested with the community partner, 
it's, it's very easy to, to convince them that computer science is more than just sitting in front of a computer writing algorithms. It's, it's about solving problems for, for like real problems for people. Yeah, and I'm sure, and you've certainly demonstrated that today with just those few examples of um, how it's being used right now. Um, just before we wrap up today, I was hoping to have you speak a bit about your career path, um, how you got to where you are today, and maybe some advice for students who are considering something similar in their future. Sure. Um, so <laughs> my career path was a little bit odd. Um, so my, as I said, my background was in mathematics and statistics. And while I was doing my, my PhD in statistics, I started working with uh, the Sagin Ojibwe First Nations here in Ontario, um, helping them do some risk assessment related to management of Lake Whitefish and Lake Huron. Uh, while I was doing that, um, the, the Sagin Ojibwe wanted to sponsor a faculty position for me uh, because they liked the work that I was doing and they felt that it would be a good match with the University of Guelph. And so they ultimately worked with the university to create a position for me. And so that position was assigned to the School of Computer Science. And so that's sort of how I fell into the School of Computer Science. Now, the interesting thing is when I was younger, when I was going through high school, my original career goal was to be an animator. And I opted to go to undergrad uh, to do computer science because I thought it would be a nice fallback. And I figured at the time, computer science was just becoming popular with animation. So very weird. Um, but then I switched into math and stats and then ultimately found my, myself back to computer science. And, and so most of the stuff for me in terms of my career, it's, it hasn't been necessarily that I, I said I want to do this thing. Um, I've just said yes to a lot of different projects and opportunities that have been presented to me. And, and that has done uh, wonders for me in terms of getting me to where I am today. So in terms of advice, I, first, don't think that you have to know what you are going to do for the rest of your life right now. I, I know people my age still don't know. I'm still changing what I want to do. Um, so don't think you have to know right now what you need to, to do for the rest of your life, but also just be open to opportunities. Um, and I've always sort of lived by, if something scares me a little bit, I, I wanna try to do it um, because I feel like there's a learning opportunity there. So I, I, I simply just say yes to things and, and see where that takes you. Well, that sounds like some um, really good advice. Uh, thank you. That's all the time we have today. But again, thank you so much for taking this time to illuminate some of those areas that computer science is benefiting our community um, and for answering our questions. Um, next week on PIR Live Event, we will be looking at one of the world's long distance migration champions, the monarch butterfly, um, with Dr. Jeremy Kerr from the University of Ottawa. More information about these webinars and other PIR educational programs are available at pirweb.org. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful day. Thanks all.